<laughs> I think you should do that again. People were not able to see that. So in the green room, as as the magic happens on your end of the world, this guy here completely loses it. And sometimes I lose it too. But today he he outlost me. Lose it again, Brett. Come on. Do the hair banging. Head banging. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't have the hair for you for effect. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I'm imagining it. All right. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Two chaps, many cultures on this. What is it? Oh, it's Thursday. Thursday. Where did the time go? I thought there was a holiday. Well, I guess not. Well, it is Thursday, and we're back with an amazing new episode of Two Chaps, Many Cultures. Brett, why is it going to be amazing? Well, we're going to we're going to go into the brain. <laughs> we're going to go into the brain. <laughs> we're oh going to we're going to explore the deep and darkest corners of the psychological world. And uh, of course, we are totally underqualified for such a for such a topic. This is why we bring in experts. And uh, uh, I'm glad you said that because I was but, worried that I'm going to have to talk about something I have no clue of. Right. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Yes, it is Thursday, and uh, may I introduce our wonderful guest who is going to talk about psychology, the wonderful Kinga Bjerwick. Yeah. Hello, Kinga. <laughs> Joining us, joining us from uh, Poland today, and um, and and looks like a wonderful evening there. It's very subdued light. It's very like kind of noir. I do like a. It's a, it, it's it's very nice with the with the wonderful kind of movie star type of look with the low key background. It's very nice. Welcome. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And hi, Brett. Hi, Christian. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, I'm actually enjoying the evening. The light is beautiful right now. The sun is, you know, going down and it's beautiful sky. It's not raining. We are coming into autumn, but the weather still is beautiful. So, yeah, nice evening here. Greetings from Warsaw. Greetings what? from Warsaw. Washawa, right? Am I saying Warsawa. that right? Yeah. Ah. And how do you say That's how do you say good evening? Do Dobry wieczór. Dobry wieczór. Okay. No, dobry, wieczór. Dobry, dobry wieczór. Dobry wieczór. Dobry wieczór. Yeah. yeah, yeah this, exactly. this, 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 this Aussie been trying to teach me Polish, but I don't trust him. I'm, 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 I'm thinking he's trying to teach me something that's inappropriate. So I better check in with the native speakers. <laughs> welcome, Kinga. Nice to have you. Yeah. Welcome, welcome. Nice to be here. So we're talking about psychology, and uh, we've been. Uh, we, I've had the great pleasure of seeing Kinga present uh, in a couple of different workshops uh, around the world on her the work that she does. But just tell us a little bit about um, what your background is, Kinga. What brought you to this field, and perhaps uh, a little bit of how you apply it to the field that we are in, in the field of intercultural work and cross cultural work. Sure, sure. Thanks, you, Brad, for nice uh, welcoming words. Um, you know, uh, I'm a fan of cross-cultural psychology, so I won't be objective here. <laughs> <laughs> so I well, just want to say that it is a great discipline. One thing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, it's true that I have been working uh, as a cross-cultural psychologist, um, including my studies. It will be 20 years this year. It's a oof, gosh, a lot of time. Started when you um, turned, right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but, you know, I graduated from cross-cultural psychology. It was something new in Poland. And um, this was something uh, really brilliant because this were uh, the beginning of year 2000. And uh, when we gained the independence in Poland in 1989, uh, we started to receiving migrants and refugees. And that's why a few people uh, thought that it might be a good idea to develop this discipline here in Poland. And also uh, the global business came to Poland with open market. We got a lot of corporations, a lot of international investments. And that's why um, there are some people or Polish people who used to live in many, many countries. And um, they thought that it would be nice to have this discipline here in Poland. So. Um, I knew that this is something for me. I really wanted to study this cross-cultural psychology. Uh, and why? I asked this question to myself many, many times, and uh, I have few answers. 
but I guess one of the answer is that um, I have an experience of being a child of asylum seekers uh, because my parents were uh, asylum seekers in the 80s uh, when uh, there were totally different times. Uh, it was really difficult time to it was difficult to cross the borders and um, my father was involved politically uh, politically involved here in Poland and that's why uh, he thought that it maybe it is a good idea to escape from the country for kind of some time and we went there we went to western Germany so I used to live there for a short period of time, and that was the first time when I had contact with cultural diversity, and it was really interesting to me. Uh, but after a few years, the um, Berlin War had collapsed, and my parents decided to come back to Poland. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm based in Warsaw. I'm living in Poland. My parents are in Poland, too. My whole family are, is living in Poland, like my siblings, my sister, brother, and we have this experience uh, in our life of living in another culture, uh, kind of forced migration. Uh, but I need to say that it wasn't so difficult as it might be for some refugees or migrants, especially right now, because that was the end of the 80s. So I think that politicians already knew that maybe the, the Berlin Wall will collapse and it wasn't so strict to get to another country. Um, so, you know, and since then I had friends from different countries, different cultures, and I know that there were so many ways how people can behave in their life because they are from different countries, different cultures. And that was amazing to me. And I decided to focus on this to, you know, to go deeper into the discipline which teach about and which speaks about, which analyze the topic of cross-cultural relations. So that's why I this is how I started, actually. This is one of the answer. I have a question. Um, yes, we're talking sure. about cross-cultural psychology, but I'm, I'm, I'm the history guy, and I'm always in armored with people's history. Um, so when you said your father was politically involved, I'm suspecting it was Solidarność, right? Yeah, All right. exactly. So, and you said before, and I, I, the choice of words you used was interesting to me, when our country gained independence in 89. For somebody who grew up in West Germany, I always looked at Poland as a sovereign independent country, right? Yes, in the Eastern Bloc, but I, I did, from a Western perspective, we didn't look at, I didn't look at Poland mm -hmm. as a as a dependent country. That That's interesting how these experiences are different or were different. Um, yeah. Now, did you not in Poland also have, in or in the Eastern socialist communist world, were there not interactions with people from different cultures? I mean, Polish, Russian, there is some difference. Polish, Ukrainian, Polish, Slovak, Hungarian, um, Balkan countries. Was there not an interaction that was noticeable or did it really just amp up after the Iron Curtain came down? Oh, thank you for, for mentioning this. Um, you know, I was a kid that time and I remember that we have contacts. We have my parents had friends from different uh, countries from the so-called East Soviet bloc mm -hmm. or Soviet bloc. And um, and thank you also, Christian, for mentioning that, you know, Poland was kind of an independent state within the Soviet uh, bloc. It is absolutely true, but uh, so we weren't like exactly part of Soviet Union, but we mm. were under the influence of, of, course. of Soviet Union. I, I think the perspective is different. You, as people in Poland, you probably didn't look at it as independence, whereas we Westerners who didn't know better thought, oh, well, it's a separate country on the map. It's got to be independent, right? So yeah. th that's how our, our brains sometimes maybe trick us a little bit. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, and it's... Um, it was so complex and it's difficult uh, also to describe this to people from other countries, from mm -hmm. the Western Bloc, for example, um, how it was, you know, how it was complicated. Uh, but to answer your previous question, that it is true that we had some contacts with people from other countries. And um, recent, I will tell you a short story. When you said that you like personal stories, I, I love to tell stories. Yes. And I have to tell you that recently I watched um, a series on Netflix about Chernobyl. Mm. So, you know, um, set part of, of uh, human history. 
Uh, but I remember that uh, there were people who suffered from, I mean, there were, there were kids uh, from Chernobyl who came to Poland for holidays mm -hmm. a year after uh, the catastrophe. Uh, and I remember that my aunt, uh, she, she's a really great person and she's Kashubian, by the way. So she's Polish, but also with uh, ethnic descent uh, from Kashubia region. This is in the northern part of Poland, close to the Baltic Sea. Mm -hmm. And I remember that uh, she um, she was a host for kids from uh, Belarus and Ukraine. And uh, she invited them. There was some kind of exchange, international exchange. And she invited those kids uh, to have holidays in Poland. So they were guests in her house. I was there with my siblings as a guest, too. And that was really nice experience. Um, you know, we were kids. We didn't know what Chernobyl was. <laughs> So um, we didn't speak the same languages, but I have to say that Belarusian language is really similar to Polish language. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was some kind of a connection, uh, like, you know, between kids, even if they don't know the language, they will find some kind of a connection. So, yeah, I remember this. And also I remember that um, friends of my parents and, and my friends, too, they went with their parents to Bulgaria, for example, or to Romania for mm -hmm. holidays, mm -hmm. sometimes to the Balkan states as well, but it was easier to travel to Romania or Bulgaria. And that was like, you know, trendy holidays to go um, to Bulgaria um, to spend holidays there. Mm -hmm. Nice. And by the way, I do remember what it meant when Chernobyl happened. So that just tells our audience that I'm a little bit older than you. And it was not pleasant. <laughs> the, the memories are not pleasant. Even even I grew up in, in West Germany. We were, I may have said this on this program before, we, we were forced to stay inside. We were not allowed to go on the mm -hmm. on the sporting uh, facilities when, when we wanted to play soccer, right? It was impossible or it, it was advised not right. to. So I was when did Chernobyl happen? 86, right? So I was 15, 16 years yeah. old then. And, and we were, this was the big fear of, of, well, if the third world war isn't coming, if the cold war isn't going to implode our planet, are we going to implode it ourselves with our nuclear power um, generation? So th this was very, I remember it as very dystopian times. Yeah. Like you know. almost unreal. Right. Uh, almost unreal. Yeah. So how did you Part get into this field? So so you, you recognize there's a demand in Poland. There's international business coming to Poland. Poland was seen as one of the more advanced economies in the Eastern or former Eastern Bloc. Um, the labor movement, the Solidarność movement had, had basically laid a foundation of a uh, high qualifying labor force. Uh, people were pouring in because a cheap labor and highly qualified uh, workers. Mm -hmm. So Poland was identified as one of those early winners of, of the Iron Curtain coming down. So there was a, a strong economic pressure to understand foreign cultures, I'm suspecting. So how did how did that shape your path career-wise and, and what did you discover? Um, yeah, absolutely. That, like, I noticed that, you know, in the 90s, there were more people from different countries coming to Poland. I live in Warsaw and um, it is funny story because we, we used to have a big stadium uh, in the uh, communism era in Warsaw mm -hmm. and in the 90s, in, un unfortunately, it didn't get any help to get renovation. So people, uh, Polish people are really entrepreneurial. <laughs> so that's why they, you know, they think about small businesses, how to gain some money. And they started like a big, big market on this stadium. I don't know if you have heard about it. It was. I've been, um, I've been there. My, you my, haven't been there. What's it called? Amazing. My, my first, my first trip to Poland was mm. 2003, and and I remember going to that stadium, and I remember it vividly. And there were people, you know, there were just people from all around the world, even African. It was, it was exactly. A these what these wonderful young entrepreneurial African people that had come to the country selling goods in this stadium, and out of their mouth coming this Polish language that it was discombobulating for me to li to watch and listen because obviously I would always thought of Poland as a pretty homogenous you know society and of course being exposed to the family that I'm connected to in Poland that was always true but then that was a fascinating market I don't know does it still exist do they still do it or 
You no. know, the, the story is really, really fun, um, yeah. really funny um, because um, um, they closed it, they closed the market and it was a disaster for, you know, small business of migrants people, yeah. uh, migrant people, and um, but they closed it in order to renovate it. And after many years, they renovated and now we have beautiful national football stadium oh, there, okay. big, yeah. big stadium. Yeah. So, Christian, it, you know, I don't know how to translate it into English. In Polish, it's uh, like stadium of 10 years anniversary, something like this, because it was mm -hmm. built, you know, according to those uh, Soviet plans. Like every 10 years, we need to have something big, something new. And I guess that this stadium was one of the examples <laughs> of this logic. So, which, which soccer club plays there, Legia or which? Um, which you know, it's it's not, a, it doesn't belong to any soccer club. Oh, Legia okay. has its own stadium right now. Okay. They, okay. I mean, they, they always had their stadium. Uh, there is also, there used to be another Warsaw football, uh, I mean, soccer club, Polonia, Polonia in Warsaw, right? but yeah. unfortunately, um, they didn't get uh, be, uh, quite good remarks and also there were no investors, unfortunately, to invest into this club. So now we have only one um, football soccer club in Warsaw and it is Legia. And thank you for knowing this. It's, you know, it's, it's hey. a small club, so. <laughs> European <laughs> soccer, we, we we know our clubs. <laughs> <laughs> so Legia yeah, is one of the best Polish soccer club, but um, but they have their own stadium. And now when you come to Warsaw, you will, uh, you will notice the new, renovated, beautiful football soccer stadium right now, which is just right behind the Vistula River. And yeah. uh, it's yeah. new, it's like totally new history, I have to say. Yeah. But you know, just to answer your question, that uh, when I was in my high school, I used to go there with my friends just to feel the atmosphere of other cultures, other mm. countries. Mm. Because as you said, Brett, there were people from different African countries, from Asian countries, a lot of people from Vietnam, for example, mm -hmm. um, and also refugees who came to Poland and they somehow tried to, um, try to live here. And that was, I think, the moment when I realized I really want to work with these people. This is something like really, really creative. And, and it's, it's really, I think, I, I felt that moment that it might be such a good adventure. So uh, I started cross-cultural psychology and uh, in, I think it was in October 2000. And in November 2000, I started to work in one of the biggest Polish NGO. This is Polish Humanitarian Action. They do a lot of projects right now uh, for the development, like sustainable development around the world. And that was the first organization who used to help refugees in Poland. So I started to work with them. Hmm. And I started to work with refugees mainly from uh, Russian Federation, mm -hmm. but uh, from Chechen Republic. Hmm. So from Chechnya, because that was in 2000 and it was like two years after the so war, the second the war, war in mm. Chechnya. And mm. that's why many people from Chechnya came to Poland. And that was the first uh, safe country for them. Mm. And we have, I mean, the majority of uh, refugees in Poland, even right now, these are people mainly, mainly from Chechnya. Oh, wow. That was an adventure because it's like totally, totally different culture. And um, the, the you know the power of honor in Israeli culture, the power mm. of family, it's something which I cannot even say it's you know similar to Polish culture. It's something absolutely um, different from Polish culture. So I had to learn a lot, but it also gave me that feeling that uh, people are very different, and we have such you know different mindset in our head if we are if we had been born and raised in another country. And uh, if you start to work with these people, you also change yourself. And this is what I also learned on my studies every day, um, that we, once we step into this road, that we start to work with people from different countries, different cultures, uh, there is some kind of a change going on inside ourselves. And it is beautiful adventure, I have to say. <laughs> I, I, I have a question about that though, um, in a, in historically being uh, being kind of an homogenous society that's closed out, closed away from the rest of the world for so long, 
Then bringing in refugees from a different background, even if they look the same, um, how does that how does the kind of social cognition of what um, people have built up or just, I mean, I would say in a closed society, people just hear stories about outside cultures. They don't really experience it. So then as you coming in pretty much on the cutting edge, right, how hard was it to, I guess, teach other people in Poland about the openness of at least learning and being curious about other cultures and as you say some of the deep psychological approaches to life that come from other cultures that on the surface look fairly similar but but are completely different so how that must have been in pretty intense work i would assume it was <laughs> to be honest yeah it was and actually you know it still is and uh, since we are still very um culturally unified country that we have like 98 percent of polish citizens uh, these are polish people white polish people and very often um, who belongs to catholic church so there is also the religion identification um, so it's a challenge you know to speak about diversity in such kind of environment um, but you know, when I started in 2000, I was a young student, I was full of passion and full of energy and I, I loved to work with difficult topics because this is what I wanted to do that time. Uh, I started to work with teachers and uh, with teachers who had refugees in their classes. And um, at the beginning, it was, of course, difficult because they have a lot of stereotypes. Some of them, they already have some prejudices. And some of them may also um, have like discriminative behaviors. So they didn't know how to deal with this cultural diversity and also religious diversity because mm -hmm. um, Chechen refugees, they are Muslims mm -hmm. and it was difficult. But you know what was really interesting in this uh, cooperation that very often Polish teacher teachers, they felt that there is some kind of a connection between Chechen culture and Polish culture. And the reason for this is that we have a common enemy, Russia. Russia. <laughs> <laughs> is, 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 is Chechen culture? I mean, it's it's a Caucasian culture. It's close to Georgia and and Ossetia and and, and Russia, yes. obviously. Is, is it is it more related to Turkish culture or more related to the the Arabic world in in Iraq, Iran? Um, Mesopotamia. What, what's mm -hmm. more, what, what's closer in influence? I would say that they are so totally unique. Even you know, in the Caucasian region, um, um, I wouldn't wouldn't say that they are similar to Turkish culture. Okay. I would say that from the whole Caucasian region, uh, the most uh, similar culture from Caucasus region to Turkish culture would be Azerbaijan. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, th there is a huge diversity in this region. I used to work there. I used to travel there as well. By the way, I really recommend you to go to Georgia. It's mm. a beautiful country between, um, it, it, between beautiful mountains, uh, Caucasus mountains, and it's really beautiful. But apart from this, it's really culturally diverse region. And there are people who are from different religions as well, living together together. Um, on the same land mm -hmm. and Chechen culture is a unique in this mosaic in this cultural mosaic because they uh, uh, they are Muslims and uh, in some ways uh, people say that uh, the type of their Islam is the same as in Saudi Arabia so oh, uh, I would say that, mm -hmm. that it's, it's becoming more and more conservative Mm -hmm. um, right now, actually, from I think it's maybe from political reasons. I'm not an expert here, but uh, this is what I know as working from 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 my experience of working with Chechen people. That because of political reasons, very often um, uh, the current president is insisting on um, on having more and more conservative way of life in order to protect the Chechen culture. Mm -hmm. But I would say that for Chechen people, the religion is not so important as their culture. Mm -hmm. And their culture, I would say it's really based on big family. I think in English, it's the, the good word is clan, like, you know, like huge mm -hmm. uh, clan. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So they, they really take care from which clan you are. And this is really uh, important for them. For example, what is your surname? Because your same surname will tell you from which clan you are. And if our clan has a good relations with your clan. So they really take care about this, um, um, I would say, group relations. So this is really important for them. Sounds a little you know, bit like Scottish or Irish culture. <laughs> yes, in that regard. yes, yes. Yeah, yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. Absolutely. Uh, maybe, you know, it's typical for, for like cultures um, who used to be, um, um, I would say, in the threat of bigger countries yes. and bigger yes. cultures. So mm. that's why they need to have tight relations in their groups. Mm -hmm. um, and what is also typical for Chechen culture is an honor. So like everything you do must be, uh, must show that you are an honorable person, that you are a decent person, a decent man, a decent woman. And um, they can even kill in the name of honor. This is something which is totally difficult to understand for our uh, even central European mind. Yes. Um, and it is a challenge, um, of course, to deal with, with this kind of cultural differences when they find themselves in Poland, for example, because we have a totally different law. Mm. Uh, when there are conflicts between clans or families, we do not kill uh, the person who is somehow guilty, who ruined your honor, for example, your mm -hmm. honor, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why, uh, you know, I, I used to work with, with them for many, many years. And sometimes it was really difficult because the cultural differences were really difficult to, 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 to you know, to, to bridge, to, to, to bridge that gap, to, to find some kind of a bridge between. Um, and how did you but, succeed you know, with, with psychology? How did psychology help you in, in, in finding the bridge? Um, you know, psychology helped me to understand that, uh, first of all, it's really unnecessary if you say to other people, especially who are in the minority group, that they need to change. <laughs> because, you know, it builds um, um, some kind of a wall between you. Mm -hmm. And um, the active listening, which is a tool in uh, interpersonal psychology, is really useful that you need to listen to these people, first mm -hmm. of all, mm -hmm. and in order to understand them. And sometimes it may take a lot of time to understand them, especially in their culture, because in uh, many cultures, the time is being perceived differently. I'm, I'm sure you are aware of it. But when you work with these people, you experience that you need to go for you know many many meetings which from my point of view were absolutely useless because we are talking about our families whether polish war and polish history chechen history russian history before we came to business and sometimes mm -hmm. it took me even a couple of months to build trust between us mm -hmm. and only if we build that trust we can speak about integration we can speak about, you know, any kind of a change which is needed to be fully integrated into the society. I, I had to say that I met great Chechen people, uh, men, women, kids, uh, who really wanted to be integrated into the society, Polish society, because they also admired the history of Poland and especially the history of uprisings. We have a lot of uprisings. So... Um, that's why they feel that there is some kind of a soul connection between us. Right. So because Poland managed mm -hmm. to to fend off these mm -hmm. two big nations to the west and the east, there were always the Germans who wanted something from the Polish and the Russians wanted something from the Polish. And somehow the Polish always managed to, at least at the end, get out of this mess. Right. And, yeah. and, and, and that's something that Chechens are, are wishing for themselves. Right. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, so so they, they are wishing this for themselves. That's why they feel, uh, many of them, they feel really uh, like Poland is their place right now, mm -hmm. that they want to live here. Uh, and they want their kids to be raised here, to go to Polish school and to uh, develop their professional career here. Um, it's not easy, uh, also from the reasons which I already mentioned, and, and you, Brett, also mentioned about that, that it's... Um, it's difficult to run any kind of intercultural 
dialogue in a, in a society which is uh, very, I would say, culturally uh, unified. Hmm. And um, and that's why it's a challenge because, you know, the integration, it's not only the decision of a migrating person, of a refugee or a migrant, but it's also a decision of the hosting society. So that's why I believe that working with the society is, uh, it takes a lot of time, but every social change, uh, it's not like, you know, a quick change. You need to take, you need to invest your time to, mm. to see the change, the social change or cultural change. Um, yeah. But it's worth doing that. Yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> it, it's, as we learn, as we try and teach our clients that, you know, first of all is to learn about yourself and perhaps your values mm -hmm. and your beliefs and how that might inform how you respond to difference and uh, even if the difference makes you uncomfortable, just so a country has to face that too, right? A country has to face its history mm -hmm. and what is what has culturally formed it uh, over, a, mm -hmm. over a long period of time. And Poland is fairly is one of, is a unique country in that aspect. But I think in in terms of then, I'm thinking I'm as you're speaking, I'm thinking just in from a, a religious point of view, a faith practice point of view. Even though we're talking uh, two different practices, both Abrahamic uh, uh, um, religions, but Muslim and Catholic, but still. The Polish, I mean, many people hold on to the Catholicism of Poland as one of the reasons it's been able to survive. Mm -hmm. And yes. been part of that uprising for many, many years, it goes back to, you know, 1483 or whatever that, you know, right? The, the, yeah. In Grunwald and that kind of stuff. So these these are repeated uh, pr things in the in the Polish history where Catholicism has been the last standing hill and it's defended Poland and its and its honor and so I think that uh, I could see Georgian people being inspired by that to say well we can use our faith of Islam to do the same thing right and we're inspired by that now maybe there's a connection there if only you know you could teach the po the country of Poland to understand that like this is where the connection lies and that's absolutely uh, if you're curious about it and you're curious about the in, the intent and the in, and, and the um uh, what drives it th then you discover as much about yourself as you do about the people you're trying to uh, invite and be a part of your society yeah absolutely yeah thank you for mentioning th this bread because you know like spiritual part of life is also important part of our life and mm -hmm. it is true that for many polish people um th their spirituality spirituality is uh shaped by catholicism by catholic church and for chechen people or uh, any other caucasian people it's absolutely normal that you belong to any kind of a church uh, or any kind of a religion and um, for example when it comes to chetan culture uh, they also appreciate that uh, polish people they are being driven by catholic church or catholic religion uh, and this is also which uh, somehow in some ways it connects us but it also it's really you know these are different religions and we have different yeah. values so sure. we have we have conflicts from time to time and uh, and some misunderstandings uh, ex about, for example, gender roles, because um, mm -hmm. it's like totally different and big topic. But uh, even you know the gender roles in Polish society, they are somehow driven from uh, Catholic religion, like the role of women, role of men. So um, in Chechen culture, the gender roles somehow they are connected to Islam. So that's why, you know, we have totally different way how we understand the gender roles. Um, but what I would like to add is that apart from the religion, uh, which might be also something which connects us, is also a value of family. Uh, because for Polish people, family is really important. Mm. Um, you know, nowadays it's maybe changing a little bit since we are becoming more and more modern society and there are different types of families. There always, there always have been many types of different families, but uh, um, it, they, they, there was no, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of voices from people from different families, like patchwork families, for example. Mm. And now, since we are becoming um, more and more adult uh, democracy, 
um, a mature democracy, uh, voices from different families or, you know, people who are not in the typical Polish norm, they are also allowed. Uh, maybe it's not easy to speak if you are from any kind of minority in Poland, but it's becoming more and more easier than it used to be many, many years ago. And But just to follow up with the family, I just wanted to say that uh, it is absolutely true that for majority of Polish people, family is a great value. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you this, um, like even friends of mine who are living in many different countries in the world, Polish people, um, when they migrate to another country, they develop sometimes, very often, they develop their career, professional careers there. And when they, their parents get sick or they need any kind of assistance, Polish people, very often, they are coming back to, Pol to Poland because they need to take care of their parents. And it's very, very common. I need to say that I support those uh, repatriates, those people who are coming back to Poland. And very often the reason for coming back is to take care about their parents. Uh, and when I speak with my friends, for example, from Sweden, from Germany, from UK, from France, it's not the reason, uh, the first reason for them to come back to their home country. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think, still really important. If someone will tell me that for Polish people, family is not a value, I won't believe no, no. <laughs> it's still a value. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Well, the, the home, right, the family home, psychologically, the family home for Polish people is, is tantamount to church. You know, I, I tell people you get invited to a Polish person's home. It, you, you are paying the respect and they give you the respect as a visitor that that is tantamount to coming to a, mm. to a sacred place and uh, mm. so food is shared in a different way but I think uh, and yeah so that might change of course you've had a lot of just um, dis, 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 uh, diaspora uh, leave and come back to Poland just for for financial and work reasons so that's kind of they've had exposure to different types of family life and that kind of thing outside of the home country and coming back and possibly re repatriation is a big issue for the, that we work through in our work, right, with families that are coming home from overseas assignments and children coming back with the uh, experience on the outside. A whole other subject, but that's uh, <laughs> something we yeah, can... Yeah, re-entry culture shock. <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Cross-cultural so, psychology, re-entry culture shock, yeah. Yeah, and that's what I'm... I mean, personally, me, me in the work that I do, I mm -hmm. try and find, even though I'm, I'm so nowhere near the, the, uh, the level of uh, education that you have in the area, but I'm always reading and trying to understand things from this perspective so I can at least inform the my you know the parents that I work with even the adults mm. and interactions of business so just how important considering the psychological and emotional and spiritual mm. effect that this experience can have so it's very 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 fun I, I bet it's fascinating work and uh, I've always been fascinated mm. by how you presented it in 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 a wonderful way I'm always of course very um uh, I'm, I have a great deal of respect as somebody who can do it in another language that is not their native language. <laughs> so that's <laughs> like my friend Christian too, you know, it's the same. Uh, yeah. This, this, is, this yeah. is a wonderful skill. And, uh, and you know, so thank you to very be, much for your work. To be honest with, to be honest, Brett, it, it, it may sound weird, but doing our work in my native language sometimes is harder for me than doing it in English. Because yeah, I, I, yeah. I've been doing it so much in English that doing it in, in German is uh, I need to consciously think about the terms or the terminology and the buildup oh. of, of content that I deliver. Um, different story. I'm, I'm yeah. curious, Kinga, um, since it takes a while to, psychologically speaking, it takes a while to, when, when cultures like Chechen culture meets Polish culture or when any type of close-knit uh, societal structures are replaced or displaced in this case. Um, mm. How much patience as a practitioner in your field do you need to bring to that work uh, before you see results? It must, sometimes it must be tiring to, to recognize, mm. I know this process will take a while. Mm. I understand it for, because I'm trained. I have the information. I have the knowledge of knowing that the human brain needs repetition and, and consistency in order to open up to this new way of thinking. Um, how, how do you stay 
whole? How do you re-energize yourself? How how do your how do you train your brain to continue to practice in this field? Mm. Oh, I like that question so much. Thank you, Christian. Because you know, sometimes I forget to take care about myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's why other people remind me about this. I mean, it's like, you know, for every kind of professionals who are taking care about mental health or other supporting other people, that it's really important to take care about yourself. And um, maybe just to answer your first question, how much patience it takes, uh, it takes a, an ocean of patience. <laughs> like, you know, it's um, you need to train this. If you if you are not a, not a patient person, you need to train this. And uh, when I was a young um, when I was, when I was a young student or after my studies and I started my professional career, uh, I didn't have so much patience as I have right now because it took me many years to to develop the skill and the state of mind even that mm. I don't get, I don't get angry, um, I don't get frustrated. Um, um, I'm not tired by the situation because, uh, you know, cultural differences might be really tiring. Uh, but to fully answer to your question, I need to say that uh, what I do um, is that I ask other very experienced psychologists to help me, to support mm. me. I never work alone. Even if I work alone as a trainer or uh, with a group or with uh, during my consultations with one-to-one, -one, one-to-one -one consultations with other Nope. Oh. Have we lost Kinga? It looks like she froze up on us. Froze up. Oh. Well, I, th I think she was, her thought was out. So I, I think the, the, be the beauty of the thought, and I want to thank you, Kinga, if you can hear this or when you, when you hear us and you're back online, I think the beauty in what she said is that even those of us who are quote unquote experts or specialists in our field, e even we need a support Sorry. system. Even we need somebody to hold us accountable. Even even a coach needs a coach, right? Mm. So if, even a, a trained psychologist needs a fellow experienced practitioner to keep you on track or to, to rein you back in or to help you stay mentally healthy. You're back, Kinga. Yes. Mm. Yes, yeah, sorry for this, like too many Zooms today, and I guess mm -hmm. that my computer <laughs> is maybe a bit tired. Oh, uh, your computer thanks, has a brain, you. all right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. How do you support uh, the psychological well-being of your laptop? This is this is another <laughs> important thing. <laughs> I'm trying to connect with it spiritually. <laughs> no, oh, I'm just boy. joking. <laughs> no, but... You know, but maybe like one final sentence uh, in, to, the, to the answer of your questions, yeah. uh, Christian, uh, Christian, that um, I don't know how it is in English, but in, in Polish we call it supervisia and probably in English it is supervision. So it is like a professional meeting with a person who is much more experienced than you. And this is what I do, actually. I go to a supervision sessions and I work with people who are uh more much experience than me and they help me to deal with different uh problems which i have in my work because i can't say that you know this work is only easy and uh, pleasant but sometimes i need help from other people support from people who can professionally help me and it's absolutely amazing because i can feel that i'm not alone and that someone really understands what i'm talking about when i'm talking about cultural clashes and it's it's amazing to be honest that you when you you leave this meeting with um, with a power that you can do it because there are other people who can support you in this and this is what i really recommend to have those supervisions yeah absolutely i i know that even just uh, after trainings and anything like that and i'm not i don't go into the depth of psychology that you do but even just working with fam as much as i love it as much as it, it is it is just the most rewarding work that I've ever done in my life. Um, mm -hmm. after you come out of a full day working with people and 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 passing on the information and hearing their uh, their expectations, their fears, their anticipations of this experience they're about to take on. You do take it on, right? And 
Uh, I think we need to be very um, cognizant of that as practitioners in this work that we do express that to people who understand what that is like and can um, can help us work through that. Because, uh, you know, I, I, I guess if I really haven't spoken to anybody that does this work that doesn't take on some of it personally, right? It, it's uh, it, you, you do take the load on and you want to serve your clients in such a generous way that you just, just you, you try and take it on and it, and it mm. becomes a little bit of an emotional burden. But um, mm. it's, not a heavy, it's not heavy if you kind of help other people lift it and, uh, and that's, the, the, that's mm. my message for today. <laughs> yeah. I don't have that. Just get let me have that one. <laughs> that, 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 that's why he calls me after his training exam. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, when, I, when, I, when I finish a training and then and, and I go back to my family, especially my wife, and I tell her, mm -hmm. hey, guess what happened today? It's I'm not saying that my wife's not supportive, but sometimes yeah. because she doesn't do our work, she's like, yeah, and how does this pertain to me right now? And what do you expect me to do? And your training is yeah. already done. And what did you do to help them? It's like. All right, okay, you were not there. Why am I bothering, bothering or burdening you with, 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 with my digestion of what happened earlier today? It's, yeah. it's. Mm -hmm. I think that that's mm -hmm. why it's important to have somebody appear in our field to to bounce this off with. Yeah. And I'm happy yeah. to have two of you right there. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have yeah, a wonderful. That's true. We, we we have a wonderful community around us across the world. You know, this mm -hmm. is. This is why we're connected with wonderful people like Kinga. Uh, the, the community we're building here, right? We're trying to, we want you to put things in the comments. We want you to comment. We want you to share and we want you to uh, to interact. We want to build a community here. We want to serve and, and have it a two-way conversation so that we can all support each other. Because especially at the moment when we're, we're kind of uh, we're we're not meeting up in person. Um, even our beloved CETAR get-togethers are all virtual now, right? <laughs> so they're all they're all becoming virtual. Um, it's important that we kind of reach out to each other and share and understand each other's mm -hmm. work and uh, and and do that. So thank you for your work, Kinga, and uh, thanks for sharing it again. Um, I think there's many more things we can talk about with you and your work. It's fascinating. That that's been wonderful. Thank you. So happy to hear Thanks, that. Amanda. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. So thank you, everybody, for joining. We'll see you uh, tomorrow, as we always do, episode 50. You know, this is a big milestone. <laughs> Everything's a big milestone. It's episode 50 tomorrow. <laughs> Who knew it? Who knew it? Uh, so just a little bit of, yeah, Jinkui me bardzo, Pani Pani Kinga. Thank you very much. Proszę uh, bardzo. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever he said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All the idiots said. All right, guys. See you later. <laughs> See you. Bye.